Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Royal Chess. My name is Jan Marcos, I'm a, a Grandmaster from Slovakia and I have prepared a series of videos on strategy for you and this series will be based on Carpo's games. Naturally um, the world ex-world champion Antoli Carpo was one of the um, best strategical player in the world so it makes much sense to learn strategy from the best and from him. Uh, today we will focus on um, the ability of making use of weak squares in the opponent's camp and we will focus on the game um, between naturally Andrei Karpo who was playing the white pieces and Boris Pasky playing the black pieces and this game was played uh, in uh, Leningrad uh, in 1974. It was the ninth game of the candidates match. I remember that this game made a very big impression on me as when I was very young because it showed nicely how patient Carpo can be, how can he use prophylaxis and also how he can distinguish between um, the more important and more relevant factors of, um, of, of the um, position and the less important ones. So let us jump right uh, into the action and have a look at the game. So. In this game, uh, the Sicilian uh, Scheveningen was played, knight f6, knight c3, d6. Please remember, Karpov is white and Spassky is black. Uh, this um, move order is not used so much today uh, because it allows uh, the quite interesting Keras attack, uh, g2, g4. Uh, Karpov also played um, this move on several occasions. But um, in his candidates match against Spassky, he wanted to be more solid and also uh, positional play suits him very well. So he played the normal bishop e2, bishop e7, castles, castles. Basically, I'm going very quickly through this initial stage of the game because uh, all this is very well known and was also very well known in 1974. Now white played f4, knight c6, bishop e3. Uh, and now black played bishop d7. Uh, maybe this is the first moment where we can stop in this game uh, because this bishop d7 uh, is not just a, a simple uh, developing move but also it consists, um, it contains a, a strategical idea which is to take on d4 and then play bishop d7 c6 and put this knight to d7. So basically black is having a very little space and he tries to regroup his pieces in such a way that he can make uh, the best uh, of, of his uh, small, small um, space. So um, basically white now played knight b3. This move is also very well known, but it is a, a very nice strategical move, which simply doesn't allow the, um, the exchange of these, two, uh, of these two knights. So the bishop on d7 stays locked there, and there is no knight f6 uh, d7 for, for black. So once white goes g2, g4, g5, this knight can feel very, um, very bad on on f6. Basically black doesn't want to put the knight on e8 because then uh, the knight uh, would be very passive and also the rooks would be uh, very unhappy uh, being disconnected. So basically knight b3 is a very nice move which uh, is also an aggressive one. White simply wants black to suffocate in his small flat and he wants to push g2, g4, g5 very quickly. And now black played a5. That was quite a uh, quite an interesting move uh, back in the 80s, sorry, in the 70s, and basically the idea was uh, to try to harass the the um, to try to harass the knight on b3, and once uh, white goes a to a4 as he did, uh, make use of the uh, of the uh, square on b4. So now black played knight b4, and his um, knight is kind of stable on b4 and he still wants to play bishop c6 and knight e7 uh, to, to make this regrouping. But uh, as you surely uh, feel, um, because I uh, suppose that uh, you are, uh, many of you are quite 
uh, quite good club players or even professional players so you surely feel that this uh, move a7 a5 is having a quite a big disadvantage which is the b5 square basically the b4 square is a, a nice outpost for uh, blacks um, for blacks knight uh, for the time being but uh, white can in the long run push it away with c2 c3 but this b5 square is uh, a completely uh, different story because there is no pawn which can or uh, which could uh, um, drive away some knight or bishop from b5 so basically this uh, b5 square is the first weak square uh, in black's camp uh, in this game and we can have a look how um, white will make use of it so but basically for the time being um, black is uh, quite active and white has to uh, make sure that he can hold his center together so he went bishop f3 and black played bishop c6 now playing g to g4 would be uh, not so clever anymore because as, as we said black is uh, nicely placed this knight goes to d7 easily so white has to switch to a more positional mood and simply make use uh, try to make use of this weak b5 square instead of instead of pushing uh, his pawns on the king side so basically white went knight d4 and black played g6 um, this might look uh, like a very strange move but it makes a very um, it makes very much sense because black wants to push e7 e6 e5 and he doesn't want to be disturbed by some knight f5 but of course even this g7 g6 is a small weakening of the king and we will see that um, uh, that in the future uh, this will also be felt basically every pawn move in an open position tends to be a weak weakening uh, because um, it creates or may create uh, some holes in your own camp so you should always think twice before you move pawns in a position where the center is reasonably open as it is in this moment on the board now white played nice a nice move rook f2 rook f2 uh, because this rook can be used both on the f file and sometimes also on the d file so rook f2 is very flexible and white can make um, make uh, some decisions about the destiny of this rook later um, we also have to say that uh, knight takes c6 at this moment is a bit premature because black would take with the b pawn and cover the weak b5 square but after e5 um, white decided to to take on c6 he took on c6 and this is a very interesting strategical decision it might look uh, a bit uh, counterintuitive because there were already two weak squares b5 and d5 which could be used by white knights so someone would could say that perhaps it is more um, more logical to to play um something like um, knight b3 here or knight b5 rather and simply try to make use of this of these two squares but uh, Karpo has got something uh, different in mind he took on c6 and after b takes c6 he took on uh, e5 as well d takes e5 and um, there, uh, there was a small transformation in the position and although this um, this pawn covers uh, two squares b5 and d5 it doesn't cover uh, this or has no possibility to cover the c4 square which is the new weakness in black's camp uh, white now wants to get to the c4 square with one of his pieces and um, make use of it um, in order to get some activity also with the exchange on c6 white was able to gain the bishop pair uh, and especially this light squared bishop is extremely uh, relevant and strong in this position because uh, the c4 square is light square and also there is a very dangerous diagonal 
uh, aiming at black's king. So, for example, even the f7 square might prove to be to be weak. So now white went queen f1. Naturally, the queen might be uh, heading for the weak square, and also he's freeing the he's freeing the uh, d1 square for the rook. Queen c8. And black uh, would love to play knight g4 here and exchange at least one of the bishops, either the light squared one if white takes on g4 or the dark squared one if white simply goes away with the rook. So white uh, fights against this uh, and now the g4 square is no longer a viable for the f6 knight. Knight d7 and now he pins the knight on d7, uh, forcing another weak, weakening. Uh, now black went h5 because it's very unpleasant to have the knight pinned in such a way. And white took on d7, again another transformation, another interesting move. Uh, white simply was able to force this a7 h5 move, uh, after which the black king feels uh, quite weak. And uh, with the exchange on d7, he stabilizes his advantage over the c4 square because there will be no knight b6 or no other way how to how to attack how to attack the uh, the, the queen on c4. So now he just jumps to c4, and black plays bishop h4, and white switches the destiny of uh, the f2 rook, and he plays rook d2. Queen e7 and rook f1. So somehow, in, um, imperceptibly, white was able to uh, get the control over uh, the, the, the two most important uh, files in the position, and also planned to plan his um, uh, queen to c4. He's also threatening bishop c5. Um, he could have naturally tried to play bishop c5 in the previous move, but black could, after queen e7, he could have played bishop c5, but after queen g5, black still gets some counterplay over the, uh, against the d2 rook, and if white goes rook d7, then he can, for example, take on c2, and this would be a mess, uh, which uh, would not be of Karpov's liking. So after queen e7, he went rook f1 instead, Continuing in his positional style, and after rook fd8, he played uh, perhaps the most beautiful move of the of the game. If you feel like stopping the video for a moment and just trying to find for yourself, that might be a good idea. So, if you want to stop the video, please do it now. And if not, uh, I will show you the move. White played knight b1. This again, uh, this move is strategically similar to the decision knight d4 b3 in the opening, white goes knight c3 b1, because if black takes on d2 then white takes with the knight, and the knight comes closer to weak to, to black's weak squares, for example the c4 square or even the c5 square, but more importantly white now wants to play c2 c3 and finally get rid of the, uh, of the b4 knight. So as you can see the uh, knight on b4 stayed there for maybe 13 moves, but this doesn't mean that it's stable there. White can push it at any moment because b4 is not a weak square, um, unlike for example c4. The queen from c4 cannot be pushed away anymore. Now black played queen b7 because he needs to prepare for the retreat of his, of his knight. Uh, so after c3 the knight goes somewhere to a6 and, and black needs to have the c6 pawn covered. Now white played another brilliant move, he played uh, king h2, restricting the, uh, the scope of this, um, of this uh, h4 bishop, and white again can prepare g2 g3, pushing away another black, um, uh, black piece. How is this possible? Well, simply the bishop on h4 is not on a weak square, so the, it can be pushed away. Now black went king g7, and white started to push black's pieces away. He went c3, knight a6. Please note how 
what a terrible piece is this knight on a6. It uh, can go almost nowhere. Uh, it's on the... Um, it's on the um, periphery of the board, and also it is not sufficiently sufficiently covered. So it's basically a very very bad piece, and uh, quite often for Carpo one such a bad piece was enough to win a game. Now another brilliant move by Carpo was Rook e2. Uh, White simply again wants to keep both his rooks in order to uh, be able to efficiently attack the f7 square and he understands that black cannot really enter uh, his um, his camp via the d file because all the important squares are just brilliantly brilliantly covered so now black went rook f8 um, admitting that uh, there is nothing he can do on the d file white went knight d2 so this knight is slowly coming to some very interesting a square it can be b3 a5 b3 c5 or c4 or even f3 g5 basically knights are the pieces which have the um the most um uh, the biggest ability of uh, making use of uh, the weak square so for example an exchange of knights would be black stream in this moment but uh he will not achieve that bishop d8 Knight f3, so the knight comes closer to the king side, and uh, it makes uh, it, it is quite difficult for black to uh, cover already the e5, uh, the e5 uh, pawn. So he decided to play uh, f7, f6, just to have it covered uh, safely. But uh, again, we have um, we have a new uh, weak square, which is the e6 square. The queen can uh, enter black's camp. Um, and come very close to uh, black's king from e6 and also uh, with the support of the queen from e6 white can also think about uh, getting uh, already to the d7 square so he played rook d2 bishop e7 queen e6 you can see how freely and easily white pieces are entering black's camp uh, the reason is uh, that there are so many holes in in, in black's camp that um, um, this makes it very very simple for the white army to enter the the position now black played rook a d8 and white took it's very difficult or rather impossible to take the rook for black because then white takes on e5 and enters uh, f7 with a winning attack so black had to take with the bishop but now Bl white comes with with another um, uh, rook uh, on the d file and as you can see white won the battle over the d7 square it's almost impossible to cover it well black found uh, one more way how to cover it he played knight b8 but now another weak square comes uh, into action which is the c5 square and white went bishop c5 rook h8 and now now please maybe we can stop for a moment and we can see uh, the great difference uh, between the uh, this the position of white pieces uh, all his pieces are harmonious and playing very well together and the black pieces which are just distracted uh, scattered around the board uh, and uh, Carpo achieved this result with purely positional means there was no combination in the game he simply insisted on um, getting to the opponent's weak squares and on uh, pushing away black pieces from seemingly nice positions but uh, um, the, the positions of black pieces were not as stable of, as whites and that made a difference now uh, there was uh, some tactic, tactics in the game after all because white now took on d8 and after rook takes d8 well here um, Spassky resigned, but after rook takes d8, bishop e7, black's position falls apart because white will take on, on f6 and then the, the, the knight will join the party and simply kill black's king. So basically this was a brilliant um, brilliant um, game by Carpo. He made use uh, of, of several weak squares in black's camp of the if you remember, there was the weak b5 square in the opening, then we had the weak 
c4 square, week c5 square, where the bishop ended, week e6 square, week d7 square, and also this weakness was uh, was created by Carpo when he played bishop g4, as you remember. So basically, the ability of uh, making use of opponent's mistakes and um, uh, making use of his weak squares is very important and um, also very important is the ability of um, pushing away patiently uh, the pieces of your opponent this also we saw in the game uh, Carpo was able to get away get rid of the b4 knight and also of the h4 bishop because uh, this um, pieces were active, but they weren't sufficiently stable in their positions because there were no weaknesses in uh, White's camp basically through the entire game. So uh, this uh, was one of the most impressive uh, Karpov's positional wins and I'm looking forward to meet you again uh, at uh, Royal Chess and I will show you some other games of Anatoly Karpov's on different strategical topics. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.